can someone do tactically to increase their execution you know, today, tomorrow? What can they do? What's the one or two things that, that an entrepreneur or CEO could do to get their team together and say, we're going to start a, uh, executing uh, more deliberately with some discipline right now, and here's how we're going to do it? It's one of the best questions anyone's ever asked me, so awesome question. Here's the two things. Number one is the 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 things that are you're asking to execute on must be specific, measurable, observable, quantifiable. You cannot hold someone accountable to delivering results if you cannot define what those results look like. So step one in creating a high performance organization of any level and being able to hold people accountable is being very, very, very clear about defining what the deliverable is. And the reason you do this, Robert, is that way if you know if if I give you and you say John, I'm going to increase sales by 83%. And you come back and I go, hey, Robert, I love you, man. We've been friends for 15 years, but you've only increased sales by 63%. Um, I'm not mad at you, but I am upset that we're 20% off. So in other words, we get to take ego out of it. It's not me versus you. It's me and you together versus those clear, quantifiable goals we set. So that's critical to, to being able to execute effectively is being able to take ego out of it and get it to a point that says it's all of us together against the clear standards of excellence that we've set and the deliverables we'd all agreed on. Uh, number two then is put it out in front of everybody. Uh, put it on whiteboards. Uh, put it in, make sure every meeting starts with a list of what's been executed, what's not. This is extremely, extremely scary for most people. Um, I've worked in a number of organizations that as soon as we decided to what I call cut down all the trees, no place to hide, you agreed to do this next Wednesday in the meeting, we're going to make you stand up and tell us whether you've achieved it or not. I get insane pushback, and that's part of changing a culture to say we we no longer tolerate mediocrity, and we don't tolerate you know not getting your stuff done. If you commit to it, if you make a promise to us that you're going to do it, and we give you all the resources you need, you need to be able to stand up in the meeting and say I accomplished it. So, number one is make it clear and quantifiable so you can hold people accountable without ego, and number two is post it everywhere so so no one can hide and everyone knows exactly where everyone in the organization stands on delivering on what they promised the leader included agreed totally yeah and, and we need to yeah. we need to pull those entrepreneurs who are looking at us both saying you guys are crazy and just kind of pull them aside beside us and say look we've been studying these companies for a long long time the best of the best the reason you're not crossing those hurdles is because you're not embracing this concept of openness and accountability and most entrepreneurs are really uh, hesitant about that most of the entrepreneurs I've met just don't like conflict. And a lot of times when you start yeah. holding people accountable, there's that level of conflict. you got to go call them out. And so yeah. you got to get over that hurdle. you just got to get over it. So um, completely yeah, and, and the, everything you're saying. The clear goals is the way to make that constructive conflict, not right. aggressive conflict. Uh, when there's, We're not arguing about what it meant. We're arguing about whether it got done or not. Because right. if we get into this, well, I don't feel like you did a good job. Or I don't think you, you delivered. The feel and the think has to go completely away from it. By the way, a great book to recommend here, I know that you would probably, is Jack Stack's Great Game of Business. Absolutely. Uh, and then his second follow-up book, A Stake in the Outcome. Those two books, along with a few others, help you get a feel for how you can literally turn around a company uh, and really make it run by allowing more information, more free flow of information, and opening up the books. A very quick example, I, I did a consulting engagement last week with a small company that was doing very, very well this year, and the, the employees were upset that they hadn't got a big bonus. But what they didn't understand was that for the last three years, the owner had been writing all of their paychecks out of his own account. He had been taking a mortgage on his house, he'd taken a mortgage on his apartment, he'd taken a loan from the bank, and he had been personally carrying all of the payroll for two years. Now that the company just landed this big multi-million dollar contract, the employees were up in arms that they weren't getting money. And I said, well, don't you know that he's a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt still? And they went, no, we had no idea. If we had known that, we wouldn't be upset at all. And as soon as they opened up the books, you, you could sh see the shift from, we want money to, how can we help you repay those bills? Right. We want to help you. You're our leader, and you covered us for three years. We want, to, we want to pay you back and cover you now. Huge advocate of the book. In fact, we set up virtual shares at both the companies I was CEO of. We weren't public, but we set up virtual tracking stock. One was based on uh, profit. One was based on EBITDA. Uh, depending on the company, and everybody had their share, and they didn't tell anybody how many shares they had, but they could yep. all talk about the EBITDA and how they could affect it. So I'm a yep. big, big, huge proponent of that. It's excellent. Now, I'm surprised, okay, and if you've watched any of my uh, past blogs or uh, videos, I'm a big proponent of 
customer first, right? And you've got it as yeah. point number six, uh, extreme customer focus. <laughs> I know it's not last but not least, right? Uh, no, well, so. it's actually, I've had a couple of people ask me in interviews recently, what's the number, what's the most important one? And although I think they're all important, I honestly believe that factor number six, extreme customer focus, is the most important. Because if you don't have that, if you have the other five but you don't have customers, you got nothing. Right, right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm with you. It's just, I believe, well, here's the way I look at it. If you have extreme customer focus, kind of by default, it will drive doing the other five things. But if you take those first five and you do them extremely well and then you turn and you focus all of that on owning the voice of the customer, of truly becoming a trusted advisor and creating a strong, um, high integrity, high trust bond with your customer, that that's the number one thing that will drive success in your business. Right. Um, you know, happy, engaged, loyal, enthusiastic customers uh, can bring you anywhere from a 100 to a 300% increase in profitability. And so, you know, at the end of the day, customers pays all the bills. They've got to be the most important as far as focus of the organization goes. Now, you talk about owning the voice of the customer. I think that's very provocative. What does that mean? What is that? What, what are you trying to say there? What I'm trying to say is, is you, need to, you need to create multiple channels of communication to your customer. You need to be the one that they talk to about their issues, their challenges, their problems, their worries, their fears. And you need to capture as much of that feedback as you possibly can. Because the more you know about them, the more you understand them, the more they talk to you, the more that you know about how to serve them well, bring products to market they'll buy, add value to them. Uh, I'll give you a real quick example. I saw a statistic not too long ago that said 63% of Americans shop in Walmart at least once a month. They got 63% of the entire country in their store. By default, they own the voice of the customer because, well, how, how do people that compete with Walmart figure out what to stock? They go shop at Walmart and figure out what Walmart is stocking, and they go put it in their store. Mm -hmm. Why? They've got 63% of the, of the population telling them what they want to buy, what they'll pay for it, and what they won't buy, and what prices are too high. That is an incredibly valuable piece of information.